Hi, this is Keith Kaiser with another word of wisdom from the Gospel according to Mark. We are continuing our studies in the week where our Lord was leading up to the cross in the Gospel of Mark. We're in chapter 14, therefore, verse 43, Mark 14 and 43. And immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now his betrayer had given them a signal, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him and lead him away safely. As soon as he had come, immediately he went up to him and said to him, Rabbi, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they laid their hands on him and took him. And one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I was daily with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then they all forsook him and fled. Now a certain young man followed him, having a linen cloth thrown around his naked body. And the young man, excuse me, and the young men laid hold of him, and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. The Lord Jesus is now arrested by this gang that has come to seize him in the garden. It's interesting that it follows right on the heels of verse 42, where the Lord said to the disciples, Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. So once more, the Holy Scriptures show us the complete foreknowledge that the Lord Jesus Christ had, that he knew precisely what was going on. He knew the timetable of going to the cross, and he had set his face as a flint to go there. This prayer in Gethsemane just reaffirmed his unwavering commitment to die the death appointed for him by God, that he would go according to his Father's will and be offered up there on Calvary. And in order to, in, in doing so, we should say, he would become the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but for the whole world. Of course, for someone to come into the good of that work, for someone to actually receive the forgiveness that is available in Christ. He paid for the sins on the cross, but it's only available to those who will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Otherwise, that payment is not reclaimed by the people that it's offered to. Now, interestingly, the Lord says, Rise, my betrayer is at hand. And immediately, that great word in the Gospel of Mark, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. There is so much irony here, because Judas is identified as one of the twelve, and yet we know he's not real. We know, as the Lord has already identified him, he's the betrayer. And verse 44 will identify him that way once more. Now his betrayer had given them a signal. Uh, it's sad that one who had such a place of privilege among the twelve, that one who could be ruling and reigning in the millennial kingdom of the future with the Lord Jesus on twelve thrones with the other apostles judging the tribes of Israel, instead has given up that privilege and has sold the Lord for 30 pieces of silver. He seized the immediate. He went for what he could see and touch and gain materially in this life. And of course, by doing so, he lost his own soul. He didn't gain the whole world. He only gained a uh, paltry sum by comparison. And yet Judas uh, would be one who would lose his own soul, the son of perdition. What an awful thing that is. And we noted last time that many people in our day are selling the Lord Jesus equally for paltry sums, for very little things, for a little bit of fleeting fame, for their own pride, uh, for their desire to live their own life without intrusion from God, many different reasons. For their lusts and pleasures, they would sell the Lord Jesus. They would say, uh, the Lord is nothing to me. He means nothing. I have no care for him. He died for me, so what? I'm going to live my own life. What a horrible fate awaits those who reject the provision that the Lord Jesus has made for them when he died that they could be saved. You know, people balk at the doctrine of eternal punishment in the Bible, and they say, how can a loving God do this? How can he consign someone to the flames of the lake of fire for eternity? And yet we look at the loving God, how he came and opened the way to eternal life, how he made a way that every person who's ever lived could be saved if they will receive 
the light that God has given them through the light of the world, our Lord Jesus Christ. And yet so many will not gain that salvation, will not receive it, because they don't want it at the nail-pierced hand of the one who demands all of them, who demands that they exchange their old condemned life for the new creation life that he offers them, the brand new life, eternal life, that he gives as a free gift, not because we're worth it or deserve it, but in spite of our uh, not deserving it, he in grace offers us this great gift of salvation. Now, they come to the Lord Jesus, of course, armed to the teeth, as if he's some super dangerous criminal. And when we think about power, the Lord Jesus as the incarnate Son of God had power that he could have just annihilated these people all on his own if he had cho chosen to draw on his divine power. Or, as he tells Peter elsewhere in John 18, for one passage, that he could ask his father for more than 12 legions of angels. And again, the angels were given charge over him, as Psalm 91 tells us, and they would have protected him and defended him and delivered him from being taken. And yet our Lord wasn't going to defend himself. He was going to go along willingly to that death of the cross. And as he said before, no man would take his life from him. He would give it voluntarily of himself. It's tragic, too, to see that as Judas approaches with this group of people under the veneer of arresting a dangerous criminal, that Judas gives this sign. How are you going to mark out the person who's to be arrested? I mean, it's dark. There are multiple people there, 13 men. How do you know which one is Jesus of Nazareth? Judas is going to seal the betrayal with a kiss. And it's uh, one of the most infamous kisses, certainly, in history. He had given them a signal. Verse 44 says, Whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him and lead him away safely. And when he says lead him away safely, we're not thinking of any kind of safety for the Lord Jesus Christ. This is safety for the people arresting him. In other words, you can arrest him without causing a row among the others or without confusion of grabbing the wrong person. And so as soon as he had come up, verse 45 says, immediately he went up to him and said to him, Rabbi, Rabbi. Now, often in the Bible we see this Semiticism, this Hebrew style, even though this is written in Greek, this is a Jewish man speaking it, and he's using that honorific title of teacher, teacher, which many people called the Lord Jesus while he was on earth. When a name or a title is repeated like this, it is a sign of great affection. Like when uh, the Lord Jesus said in Acts chapter 9, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Or when David said in the Old Testament, Absalom, Absalom, my son, would to God I had died for thee. Or when the Lord Jesus said, Martha, Martha, thou art cumbered about with many things and uh, sorrowing and so forth, and, and told her that one thing is needful. But anyway, the Lord here receives this greeting from Judas, and Judas is talking like someone who is deeply affectionate toward the Lord, because when you repeat a name or a title like this, that's an expression of deep love and loyalty, supposedly. And yet, in the mouth of Judas Iscariot, this is pure hypocrisy, because he has not bowed to the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. He has not obeyed what the Lord Jesus taught him. And to add insult to injury, it says, and he kissed him. So he comes up feigning to be the devoted follower, feigning to be the pupil that is loyal to his teacher. And yet it couldn't be farther from the truth. He's selling out the Lord Jesus. He's delivering him up to be killed. Then they laid their hands on him and took him. And one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Now this, we know from other Gospels, was Peter, and that the Lord uh, did not allow him to carry that through. And the Lord even healed this man's ear, because as he said to Pilate, uh, if my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered. But now is my kingdom not from hence. So to establish the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ and to advance that kingdom, the Lord Jesus strictly forbade the use of force of arms. We are not violently extending the kingdom by the sword or by gun or by any other weapon. It's not by coercion. It's not by being theological bullies. It's the persuasion of preaching the word of God and letting the Holy Spirit work in men's hearts 
to convict them of their sin and their need of the Savior. That's our weaponry. Our weapon is the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of truth. And we have the whole armor of God, that all of these are spiritual weapons. As 2 Corinthians reminds us, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down every imagination of high things, and bringing every thought into obedience uh, of Christ, and so forth, to the captivity of Christ. So in any case, uh, what Peter does here is a rash action. Now it's interesting that Mark doesn't mention his name. Probably this is out of deference because we remember John Mark was Peter's helper. And so often in these books that are written from a particular writer's point of view, they don't name themselves. Like John doesn't speak of himself except to say the, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And in similar fashion, John, writing about Peter's rash act here, leaves him unnamed. But the Lord uh, shows the peaceful nature of his ministry. In verse 48, Jesus answered and said to them, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I was daily with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. So the Lord Jesus here knows that uh, this is not a, a just thing they're doing, nor is it rational, because he's not been violent, he's not been a dangerous criminal, he's not been someone who is really a physical threat to them, and yet they come out with the ancient equivalent of the SWAT team, ready to arrest the Lord Jesus and uh, fight his followers and fight him if need be so. And yet that's not going to be the case. Now it's interesting how quickly whatever kind of zeal the disciples had for defending the Lord, how quickly that evaporated when they took stock of the numbers arrayed against them and the weapons they had. Verse 50 says, Then they all forsook him and fled, which is precisely what the Lord Jesus had predicted earlier in this chapter, back in 20, verse 27. I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. So they all forsake him and flee. Now how much did they flee? So much so that a certain young man followed him, it says, having a linen cloth clothed around his naked body. Now, seemingly this fellow was somewhere nearby sleeping, and he was awakened. Again, a lot of people think it was John Mark because he doesn't name himself, and yet he obviously knows what was going on with this young man. This young man heard the ruckus, came out to see what the hubbub was all about, what sort of fight is going on in this garden. They grabbed hold of him, and he thought that discretion was the better part of valor. In other words, he turned tail and ran, and he left the linen cloth. So he left his jammies and took off naked. This was the kind of terror that this group inspired in others. And I can well understand it with people coming with weapons and clubs, and here you come out to see what's what, and suddenly you're seized. What might happen to you? Well, if you can get away, you run for your life, and you even leave your garment behind. And yet, in the midst of it all, we see the Lord Jesus making no attempt to get away. He's absolutely unflappable. He's imperturbable. He's not going to panic. He's not going to become terrified and run away. He, as he says elsewhere to Peter at this incident, the cup which my father has given me, shall I not drink it? So the Lord Jesus is willingly going to Calvary in spite of the physical uh, trouble that this brings him and the pain that it's going to bring him into and ultimately the spiritual suffering of dying on the cross for our sins the Lord Jesus is going up for that now it's fascinating that the Lord Jesus although they could have arrested him in the temple at any moment we know from other verses why they didn't they feared the people they didn't want to cause a riot they didn't want to arouse the interest of the Roman authorities they preferred to maintain their autonomy insofar as they had it and to kind of police those precincts without intervention from the Romans. So they didn't want to draw undue attention to what was happening in the temple. That wasn't the right place to arrest Jesus. And yet we know the injustice of what they were doing, the fact that this is not legal at all, this has nothing to do with truth, nothing to do with justice, is borne out by the fact that they do it at night, they do it in a garden, in a secret place. They do it privately, as it were. They apprehend the Lord. This is not an open and above board procedure. This is not them pursuing the truth and nothing but the truth and apprehending a dangerous criminal. This is them 
pursuing an innocent man, yea, a perfectly righteous man, one who did no sin, neither was there guile found in his mouth, one who always did those things that pleased the Father. And so the Lord Jesus is being apprehended here in a way that's consistent with their base motives. It's all about their envy, and Pilate would later perceive that that's why they delivered him up. It's all about their evil machinations, their plotting, their lusts, and their desires. It's nothing to do with anything wrong that the Lord Jesus had done, because frankly, he did nothing wrong. And this is just showing how government power can be abused and innocent people can be persecuted by the government. But what is the example that the Lord Jesus gives? Well, the same example that Peter later explains in 1 Peter, that we are to suffer for Christ's sake. We're to follow his example. We're not to suffer for being evildoers and get the just consequences of what we've done. Rather, when we suffer unjustly, that is thankworthy to God. Then we're honoring God. So although this is unjust, the Lord Jesus submits to it. The Lord Jesus doesn't retaliate. We remember what Peter said, who when he suffered, he threatened not. When he was reviled, reviled not again, but committed himself to him who judges righteously in First Peter chapter 2. So we are to emulate that example. We, we are also to suffer in this world without recrimination, without casting curses on those who would hurt us or trying to fight back. Rather, as believers, when we suffer for Christ's sake, we're to go along and to bear it as the Lord gives us strength and to honor him by our testimony in it. And that's what being a martyr, a witness, is what that word means, is all about. And some are bearing witness to their faith in Christ today by suffering unemployment for Christ's sake, by suffering poverty for Christ's sake, by suffering imprisonment for Christ's sake, and in parts of the world there are even people dying for their witness to the truth of the risen Christ, that he is worthy of them pouring out their lives even unto death, because he is the one who poured out a life of so much greater value for them. So may we indeed pay attention to our Lord's example in suffering and say, Lord, strengthen me and teach me how to bear persecution and bear those who would make fun of us and, and call us things in this world. Help me to bear it in a way that glorifies the Lord Jesus and that wins men and women, boys and girls, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you very much for listening.